Welcome to RVEM Podcast, industry's winning information network. Clarity is what we all could use. RVEM Mastermind Podcast is bringing together the greatest business minds to reveal where we are on the business map, what's working, and what's not working. Our guests will be sharing industry reports and forecasts, practical business tips, and experiences that will improve your perspective, business growth, mindset, and motivation. There will be no fake news allowed. Honest, real vendor and operation reviews. Buckle up and welcome your host, Hottest Industries Leading Forward Expert, Christina Schreider. Ready? Yep. Well, hi, Tom. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Christina. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you again for coming up to RVEM. And it's such a pleasure. Usually when you and I talk, I learn so much from you. And I start to have a little different perspective when it comes to marketing. You know, when it comes to marketing, sometimes we feel too much freedom. You know what we can say because we can cover ourselves up and lead into that and that. But I understood after talking to you, it's lack of my education. You know, what's possible thing can happen. So anyway, thank you again for coming over. Um, I have a question for you. Okay. What is going on in your world right now? Is there something particularly, you know, dealerships maybe maybe bring into your attention or you think they should, you know, have pay attention to something due to what, what kind of timing right now? Yeah, great question. So uh, I just got off a Zoom call um, and the dealer, I, w- I reviewed his insurance policy and I went through the insurance policy with his insurance broker. And I had 107 questions that needed to be answered because there was a lack of clarity in the policy. The policy had a lot of blanks in it. Uh, Nobody pays attention to the policy after the insurance company sends it to you. They just throw it on a shelf and don't look at it again. Insurance policy is like a living, breathing thing. It's something you have to pay attention to. It's something you have to ask questions about. Uh, You have to make sure that what you paid for is actually what you get. And so I just spent the hour right before we got on our Zoom call going through all 107 questions uh, with this dealer's particular insurance broker. So he has to go back to the insurance carrier and decide or get the information and, uh, and get back to me. Part of that, Christina, is I asked a lot of questions like, could we insert a deductible in here and maybe save the dealer some premium? Uh, There are certain uh, coverage lines that were duplicative. So the dealer was actually paying twice for the same coverage. I said, can we eliminate that and save the money? So it's it's a process of trying to make sure that the dealer, both that we can reduce the premium when appropriate, but increase the coverages. So I had 107 items. So it's look to me what you just said. It's not only you help them with the risk mitigation, right? You also negotiation part. So not only you protecting them from future, you know, loss, even bigger, but current ones. So they're paying for something they maybe shouldn't pay now. And, you know, it's funny you say that because you know how right now in a digital world, right? Even when you buy a new cell phone, you know, when you go to some social media or you go to some websites, you just click, you know, agree, accept, blah, 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 blah. So you know what I mean? Like people don't really pay attention. We don't read this stuff because right. so everywhere and it's like, ah, oh, it doesn't really hurt us, right? Because right. nothing really yet pinch it, you know? We don't know sometimes what it does, but it's not, right? Right. And uh, I think we start to look at the very important documents like you mentioned, insurance, same way. You know, like it's kind of a big mistake in not understanding what's can cost us, right? Yeah, I thought... Find- I find that dealers don't understand what's inside the policy. So the, one of the first things that I do when I work with a dealer is I'll pull their insurance policy out and go through some of the coverages, make sure they understand what it is that they bought, make sure they understand where there are holes, right? If there's a hole, then you can talk about how you want to fill it. If you feel strongly that that's a problem uh, for your dealership, some dealers are like, that's not a problem for me here. Uh, One example is third-party discrimination coverage. That was one of the 107 items. So a customer comes in and and can make an allegation that you discriminated against them. You didn't sell them 
you know, the unit because they were a minority, for example. Some policies have coverage for that, some don't. So that's a point that you need to understand whether your policy covers something like that. If it How doesn't- easy, I'm sorry, interrupt you. How easy ahead. it will be for customer it's actually a very awesome point. And I know it's kind of changing where I was going, but I think it's a very important because right now in this generation, you know, it's easy, right? To get accused on something because people are looking for income and I'm not really judging nobody or maybe I am. Like, you know, let's talk about automotive, right? When somebody gets in a car accident, they go full, you know, considering as an income, we have a lawyer who is advertising this. So it's kind of almost becoming, you know, the way of generating your income, right? With that said, how often, I mean, we already know it's possible, can happen, but what chances this customer who come in to dealership and say, hey, you discriminate me because blah, blah, blah. How easy for them will be to go after, you know, particular dealership, you know, and cause the problems or how much it can be um, as expense and attorneys for dealership. Right. Well, right now in the RV world, because there's such a lack of inventory, um, maybe somebody calls up and says, hey, will you hold the RV for me? I'll be there in you know, six hours. I'm driving from Georgia or mm -hmm. Florida or whatever. Will you hold it for me? And of course, as the dealer, you never know whether those people are going to show up or not. And then let's say you sell that unit who, to someone who comes in you know, 10 minutes after that. And then they come down, they get there, they're like, where's the unit? And you're like, we just sold it. Customer gets upset, right? When a customer gets upset, if you don't have a good process in place to take care of that customer, then they can make all kinds of allegations. Who knows what the allegations are? So it's important to know what your processes are and dealers should have a process on how they're gonna handle their upset customers which is really important because that's what keeps the lawyers away. And that's what keeps the regulators away is having a process to deal with upset customers. Well, the upset customers is, you know, like we're going back, there's usually they will write bad review one or two and depends. And I think because not most of the time it's going all the way to the courtroom, right? Because people get tired or whatever it is. And I think dealerships also get comfortable with that okay well maybe it's going to be paying in about this much but we have a mentality we get a sell 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 now right so that's kind of not really worrying about it so the question i have like what's average can cost to dealership right if somebody decide hey i'm gonna go all the way in right i am gonna go to court you know and uh especially like those ones who does by themselves not finding lawyers because usually lawyers say, eh, not a big deal. I don't want to deal with it. Right. And they get discouraged. But if those ones who are stubborn and they're going to go to a court, how much usually this around, you know, what's kind of, what's going to cost to dealership? Well, I've been, I've been involved in litigation, Christina, where uh, I spent $80,000 in one month on lawyer's fees. So yeah. it's, it's, it's not hard to do actually. So that's why I always advocate with all my dealer clients that if you get a lawsuit, there's a certain way to do it. There's a certain way to get it resolved. Uh, there's a certain time to get your insurance company involved, depending on what the lawsuit's about. But early resolution is always going to be your best bet. When a consumer takes a dealer to court, the dealer's going to lose. It, it's really very simple. Um, dealers are not... Uh, the favorite of judges and they're certainly just not favored so it's really silly for dealers to go to court it doesn't matter and I hear dealers all the time they say we didn't do anything wrong yeah we, we, we didn't do anything wrong it really doesn't matter whether you did anything wrong or not the important thing is that you need to have somebody come in and resolve it or if you can't resolve it then hire somebody like me who can come in and resolve it but that way you can concentrate on running the business. It's a big distraction. These lawsuits are really a big distraction. So it's not, not just the insult of the lawyer's bills. It's also the fact that it takes time and attention. For example, how terrible is it when your employees have to go uh, get deposed? They have to answer questions under oath. It's terrible for morale. 
It's nerve wracking for employees. They get very upset about it, uh, with rightfully so. So it's, there's, it's not just the hard cost of writing the check for the lawyers. It's, there's a soft cost in, involved too for the dealer in him worrying about it, him or her taking their eye off the ball and, and running their business, and then all the other people that it touches. So it's, it can be very stressful. You know, also, if you really think about it from a psychology point of view, it's, it's all better get somebody third party involved because you don't have emotions in that, right? You can think rational and you can really actually stay focused. If it comes to us, if I have my own dealership, right? And uh, that's my legacy, right? That's my pride. And I don't want to feel like I'm the one who's wrong. Also, there is another fears, right? So I'm already emotionally involved. Like you said, I didn't do nothing wrong. There is also another fear you, you think, and what if you don't have a good culture or something? Can those salespeople, marketing people, service people, any employees, you know, testify actually, you know, what you want them to under pressure? Is it somebody going to do it? Is it like you say, in our policy or insurance or employing, you know, agreement, can they deny that or not, right? So what if a particular person is maybe not a big fan of you? So there's a lot of things, emotions and fears going on in this time. And that's, I think, more often we see they just, you know, like settle and give the money. Now, okay, well, let's just settle and give the money and it's still a big chunk, which is you can avoid, right? Kind right. of interesting. So basically what I see what you're saying, the better, you know, not even to get there, right? To have somebody actually, you know, like, let's look at it first. So let's make sure you don't have these problems in the future. Or if you do, you know, you know how to handle it, right? Right. I mean, these dealers, they're running a for-profit business. And when you're running a for-profit business, you're for-profit. So it's all about how you're going to make money, or in this case, how you're not going to lose money. It's not a non-profit business. This is, this is not a chair. Dealers don't run charities. And so if you ran a charity, you can talk about who's right, who's not right, and the morality of it, and the you're running a business. So if you're running a business, you need to run the business in order to make the most money. And in order to make the most money, sometimes you have to cut your losses and move along. So that's really what, in, you know, in the case of a lawsuit, that's really what it's about. There's a notion in the claims business that your first loss is always your best loss. And what that means is the sooner you fix a problem, the less expensive it's gonna be. If you let it linger and you push it off and you punt it and you not worry about it and do it another time, it's going to get more and more expensive as time goes on. So it's really important, uh, which is why I advocate that you know you have to have a process in the store for how you handle disgruntled customers, whether they're right or not. So speaking of this process, well, first of all, I want to say that you know I really like how usually you say you not only you know for dealers who keep their money, not only make money, but keep their money. I think it's a big part of it, right? We can make so much money, but if we end up losing them on some decisions, what's the point? We just waste so much time, right? right? When it comes to process, right? Um, and especially right now, what we see, you see no lack of inventory. It's there, lack of parts. There's a lot of things going on right now. Sure. And, but same time, it's nothing changed most of it in most dealerships when it comes to goals for salespeople and sales teams, expectations and stuff like this, and they pay plan, you know what I mean? Things like that. So especially from the psychology point of view, for almost a year used to make so much more money than, you know, any time prior, maybe like, you know, whatever. And now it's kind of, you, you got comfortable, you want that again. So a lot of people get very creative. Let's put it this way, right? Uh, get creative with what they say to customers, especially if it's going to come to let's collect deposits, which is we know, you know, like, hey, the elephant in the room, we never know what when unit is going to arrive for real, right? We don't know if right. price is going to go up or not, right? right. And the, there's a sales, marketing, service, parts, you know, delivery, all that. Teams, they can say something, right? Maybe what shouldn't be said and it's going to cause the problems as well. So how you suggest to deal with it? You said the processes. So 
who is main need to be trained, how they need to train and whom after, where is going, it's go to HR, it's go to um, department managers, or it's go to principals. What's the process you suggest in this case, what to watch out for? Well, you asked me multiple questions. So I know, me, I'm excited. Let me, let me see if, let me, let me start with the first one. I think the first question you asked was, when the manufacturer's pricing goes up, how do you handle that? Because at the time that the customers are putting their deposits down for their RV, the, the, it could take 60, 90, 120 days before the units are actually coming in. So what do you do about that? My opinion about that, and, and this is kind of the human approach, is you, could, you really can do it one of three ways. You can either say to the customer and have them sign, I would have them sign a piece of paper that says, if there's a manufacturer's price increase, these are the three options. You'll pay all of it, the dealer will pay all of it, or we'll split it 50-50. And if it's too much or you don't like it, you can always get out of the deal, no problem, right? Because because that should be part of it because you can certainly sell it to somebody else. I mean, right now there's enough demand that, that if they want to put a deposit down, even if they want to back out, you've got another buyer. So it's not that big a deal. So what I advocate for that process is make your decision, tell the customer up front that what's going on, always better to tell them up front and set the expectation. We've seen some price increases for some manufacturers. You can expect that may happen. We don't know, but we're in business and we can't absorb 100% of the cost, but we'll split it with you. Or you're gonna to have to absorb 100% of it. And this piece of paper here says, that either you're gonna absorb 100% of it or you can get your refund back. It's your choice, either way is okay with us. Then it's dealt with, it's out there, the customer understands, then it's not a point of contention when they come back, right? All of a sudden they've been waiting four months and you call them up and say, your unit's here and they are excited and they come in. And you say, oh, by the way, you, know, you have to pay another $3,000. And they're like, well, what do you mean? So, no, the, you didn't tell me that. We don't know. And so it's all about setting expectations. So I think it's really important to have the paperwork reflect that up front, whatever the dealer's decision is, whether it's the dealer's going to pay for, or the customer's going to pay for 100%, or the dealer's going to pay for 100%, or 50 50, or whatever that it is. I think it's really important to just go ahead and say that and get that out of the way. At the time the customer's putting the deposit down, they're so excited. Um, they'll understand it, they won't love it, but they'll understand it. Uh, and, and I think it's uh, setting that expectation that that may be an eventuality. And then when you find out, by the way, if you find out before the unit gets there, then you should call them and tell them that. Don't wait, don't wait till the unit's there. I think that's a mistake too. I think that upsets them more. Like you knew, you knew, why didn't you call me and tell me, right? Give me the choice then, or give me some time to think about it. Because when the unit comes in, the dealer's like, okay, it's here. I want my money, get it out the door, right? So if you get the information that you are gonna have a price increase, I think it's important to call the customer at that point and say, hey, I don't know if you remember, we went through this piece of paper. It says there's gonna be a, potentially be a price increase. We had one. It's two thousand dollars. We're going to split it with you. It'll be a thousand for you and a thousand for us, and we'll help you with your financing or you know whatever else you want to talk about at that point. I'm making notes because it's brilliant what you're saying. So I'm not being rude. All right, you did answer the first question. I do apologize. I kind of oh I want to know it all because I know okay. we're in a time limit. So and what you shared it's, it's it's I love it right, and I'm sure whoever listening that they need to pay attention because you really don't lose. People are afraid they're going to lose with that. But if you do have, like you say, right process, you make decision, you stick with it, you make some legal paper. And so customer can be, and you bring the clarity, transparency, they can acknowledge in this paper, right? And then there will be no conflict if you tell them when you get aware of this, you know, uh, a price increase, because if you call them, either it's give them time to say no, so you can start to put for sale again, right? Or to find more money if it comes to that point, right? Sure. Absolutely. So Absolutely. then second question was, when you do this, right? Okay, you put this in the process and stuff like this, and they made decision and all, how managers need to deal with their employees, you know, with the teams and what do you should educate them, right? Let's say if I'm a manager, 
I got all this information from the, you know, um, director or GM or owner or dealership. What do I need to tell to my team, right? What do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. Because a lot of times when it's on the phone calls, they're just trying to say anything that's possible to bring people in, right? Even mm -hmm. for deposits, because we're still going through digital transaction and not everybody comfortable with it, you know, and stuff like that. So what's your suggestion? What me as a manager can, you know, either teach or explain or watch out for and need to talk to with my team, no matter what, sales or marketing department? On, on which topic? On, the, on the topic, let's say we got, we got it uh, with new rule. We're going to collect deposits, right? And this is transparency. We're going to offer a customer with paperwork to sign it. We're going to make sure we tell them, you know, when it's the units coming in, right? That's, we agree on that. This is it. That's what we're doing. So what do we need to teach our team to not to say if they try to convert? The, the, the truth right? You always got to, you have to say the truth. Anything that's outside of the truth, you're going to potentially have a problem. So salespeople, sometimes some salespeople have loose lips and they just say things. So if there's a mistake that's made or something that's said that's, that's not correct, the manager needs to correct that as quickly as possible. So when customers' expectations are not met, that's usually when you have a problem. So if the salesperson sets the expectations here, and for whatever reason, you know, it only happens to here, that's when the customer is going to get upset because they're going to say, hey, you, you um, told me that, that it was like this. I mean, for example, when I bought my RV, I bought a Winnebago, a 24J, and I drove about five hours to go get it. And my ignorance, I thought that the, this was a class C. Uh, I thought there was a bed over the um, drivers, uh, over the drivers. In this particular case, there wasn't one. It was there was cabinetry. It was lovely cabinetry. But I drove, you know, because I, I didn't know the 24 J or whatever the model number was had cabinetry or could it? I thought it would be like if you got that model, that's how the that's how the layout was. And I got there and I was like, oh man, this is not exactly what I wanted, but because of the supply, you know, the supply and demand issue, I bought it anyway. Mm. Um, um, but but that that kind of thing, right? I drove five hours and and I, I walked in and I was like, <laughs> this isn't what I thought it was gonna be. So whenever your expectations are not met, that's when inflation happens, right? And so the manager's job is to minimize any friction. So the, does it mean in this case is um, as a manager, my job is not only make it clear, you know, to my team, right? All right. So we have, if we decide to collect the deposits, right? This is our new policy. You, wanna, you cannot tell a customer or not tell customer upfront before they come here and deal with us that increase of a price will be on them, right? But it is a refundable deposit. Because what I see, what you just mentioned, imagine that if I'm a salesperson or marketing case, right, something, and I just need this convert, need the people to come in, I need to meet my goal. And maybe I'll be intimidated, you know, if they don't show up, if I tell them on the phone, because mentality is still there, oh, like well. we need to bring them in, right? And I would no, not I mean, tell I'm not, them. I'm not saying that you bring the, you tell them that before they come in. That's not, until you've sold the unit, until the customer has purchased the unit in their mind, that's not something you wanna go over. They have to come in and sell themselves as well as the dealership selling them on that unit. Once they are say, okay, I'm ready to go. You start to do the paperwork. Part of the paperwork is, okay, now let's talk about what happens if, here's what, I, you know, here's what we have seen happen. Not up front. Oh, but they, if they don't have a unit for sale. So if it's unit on order, right? And like you tell customer, all right, you got to come in and we're going to talk about, you. but there is no unit inside. So how do we solve this problem without getting in trouble? Like, can we say to no, them? Well, you, that, you can get something similar. You can walk on something similar I and see. say, on, you, on yours, the dinette's going to be over here. The bed's going to be over here. 
you know, this is the same manufacturer, so you can get an idea of the quality. You know, you can still have the salesperson demonstrate the the, the unit. Um, they'll just have to point out what the differences are. Of course, the brochures all have the layouts, you know, very clear. And so you go back through and say, no, yours is going to have this, and the toilet and the shower are separate, and that's important to you, right? And so you're selling features and benefits while you're doing that, but at the same time, you're making very clear what their decision is, what their purchase is, so that you know you're not buy, you're not uh, delivering them something that they don't even want. Understood. So transparency upfront, be honest with what's going on, because we really don't have to be afraid. Even you bought the unit without bed because you want to have a V. Right. Then you don't know when you're going to get another one. So we shouldn't be that much. We need to let the mentality of being afraid customer would not, you know, will be arguing so much and understand they also don't have a choice sometimes. Right. So be okay with being more clear about that. Right. Right. Sure. And salesmen are naturally nervous about, you know, selling and having the customer walk to, you know, walk away or go to the next store down the road or whatever it is. I mean, that's just natural. That's part of being a salesperson. How much compliance, you know, need to be involved or, you know, is there any thing, something specific, specific we need to think about when it comes to phone calls? If we do the phone call to a customer, right? And a salesperson or somebody, you know, in BDC department say something, it would be either taken as offensive and per se it's not recorded, right? Or it's gonna be something that offensive to a customer, right? Like you say, oh, you know, whatever. Or it's gonna be something like, well, you told me, you know, this unit have that and that, and I came here. You know, the phone conversations, if customers stay before you and say, on the phone, you tell me that and that and that, how much power it has. Oh, yeah, so the, so the answer to your question is, is cut, you know, communication is the key, right? So what the salesman said or didn't say, may have left an impression with the customer and the sales manager is going to have to clarify that to make sure that the customer understands so that there's a meeting of the minds. Without a meeting of the minds, you don't, you've don't you got nothing. So uh, I advocate that sales managers listen to a few phone calls. Like one, if the sales manager can listen to one phone call, if they record their calls, listen to one phone call a day. Counsel that particular sales agent what they said or shouldn't have said or might have take the 15 minutes a day it's well worth it the salesman will be more precise as a result you'll have less customer issues because they know that you're listening whenever they know that big brother is listening of course they're going to be more careful uh, and it's also a good training tool so uh, sales managers should be having those conversations regularly with with uh, sales agents on how they're communicating with their customers or what they're saying, or what they should say. It's, a, it's an important part of the process. So from all what we just talked about is everything comes to you need to be prepared, right? You need to either learn and train yourself and others in your team, or you need to hire somebody who's gonna come and do this for you if you are busy and too emotional, right? There's a right. need to be, like you say, this process is because we, there's so many little things, like you're saying, right, can cost us losing that money, you know, and losing this piece and also put the employees in an uncomfortable situation where they may have to testify something or may have to say something. They may be not comfortable to be even involved in it. Either right. that or something as something as that regularly happens, you'd be surprised as the local TV station shows up and wants to do a story because the dealership has had a customer's RV for two months and they just took delivery and they're really irritated because the, the parts are all on back order uh, and that kind of thing. Do your, does your staff know what to do if a news crew shows up, right? What is your process? Do you have a process for things like that? Th these are, you need to have a process for everything related to uh, customers, and employees both, it's important to, to know how you're gonna handle those problems and also advertising problems. The, the way that dealership problems start, the three biggest ways dealership problems start is disgruntled customers, disgruntled employees, 
or false advertising or what they believe to be false advertising. And also how we handle those reviews. And also how you handle the reviews, of course. I mean, if you don't have a good process for how you handle the online reviews, then you are going to get lawsuits and you will get regulators who come in and tell you how to run your business instead of you being able to run it by yourself. No, this is very big deal because that's not only phone conversation when manager can, um, you know, fix something. Maybe that's not person to person, you know, communication when you can uh, say, oh, there's misunderstanding. There's that because now you have this out there and a thousands, thousands of people can have their own opinion how they read this. Like you can send a text message even between wife and a husband, right? You can mean one thing and oh, we complain. You know what I mean? Like it's kind of, it's so hard, depends how you feel at the moment, how you decide, you know, and you react on that. So yeah, when you have something out there like that, and maybe you are right, you know, what you say in there, I am right. And there's so many people can add to it and get offended. Oh, you reacted like this It's probably because, you know, like you say, racial thing, right? Or because of that and that and that. And this is something, you know, um, very much dangerous in my opinion, because this is right there and it's not one person who can do the screenshots and, and there's a lot of activists there, you know, who can take it to the next level, not only for yeah. reputation, but actually cost money. Right. So right now it's look like it's a good time, right? Like, because unit selling, we have to, we, we're getting creative with the marketing, you know, for the certain things, but there's not really as much pressure as usual right? Because there, you don't have an inventory. What are you going to do? Just keep the customer you have and try to keep the market share with the things what you're doing, right? Right. Isn't it perfect timing now to get actually this, you know, the, the clean, spring clean, summer cleaning, right? And look, or, you know, look at your operations, look at, the, you know, all the legal papers, what you have, you know, like, and try to reinvent something if it's needed, or at least analyze what you got, if there's a, something you need to, you know, work with. Right. Yeah. Now, I mean, it's always now is always a good time to start on how you can transfer your risk, how you can be compliant and what you're going to do to make sure that you don't have any disputes with either your customers or your employees. So absolutely. Now, now is the time and now is always the time. But it's this is something that you have to work at every month. It's not something that you work at and then you put it on a shelf and say, I'm done all finished and I don't have to do anything anymore. It's continuous improvement activity. You have to continually work at trying to mitigate the risk for the dealership and make sure that the small problems don't become big problems. I have a last question. How do you deal with the dealerships, right? With the dealership principals or owners who uh, maybe disregard your suggestions? right? Or they didn't feel that important. You know, when this moment come, aha, I told you so. He cannot come in and say, hey, I told you so, ha ha, right? You don't feel like that. So how do you deal with this maybe somewhat rejection, you know, what you try to bring it up? So, so it's a good question, Christina. So my, my job as a consultant is to say, here are the areas where you have risk. And then we have a conversation about risk tolerance. The dealer may say, none of that stuff worries me, and to which I say, okay, no problem. Let's move on to the next thing, right? So it's all about what you're able to tolerate as the dealer. But what I want to advocate the most is that they're making an active decision on their risk instead of not knowing, right? One of the lessons that the, the dealers learned and going through that 107 items, and that took us almost four hours to go through, through Zoom calls, is I said, did you know that this is part of your policy? Were you aware that this is how this would be handled if this happens? And in some cases they said, gosh, that's really a problem. Why don't you see if you know, we can get the insurance company to give that coverage back to us or we can buy it back um, or that doesn't bother us. But as long as they're making an active decision, that's what I advocate. So it's not my job to say, you know, you really are going to make a mistake on this. After I explain it and say, I really feel strongly that this is something you pay attention to, it's up to them. That's that's their decision. It's their risk. It's not my risk, right? They're the ones who have the millions of dollars of inventory and building and land and 
equipment and tools and everything. That's their risk. So when they put their feet on the floor in the morning, that's part of what they have. So as long as they're comfortable with it, that's fine with me. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't upset me. I just want to make sure that they understand the decision they're making. You know, it's remind me of a good, good parent. <laughs> you know, uh, when, you know, it's, it's real. I'm a parent myself. I have three kids, right? And they not necessarily want, especially my 12-year-old who thinks she's whatever, 16 already, don't want to listen, right? And I actually find when you were just speaking, I'm like looking back, that's what I kind of feel about my daughter, right? I love you, I care. And at least I'm going to say, hey, if you do this, you want to dye your hair, you want to do that, or you want to do this, these choices can come to it, right? Right. That's kind of, and then when we're growing up, you know, like looking back, I'm like, oh, I wish I listened to my parents. Oh, I wish I listened to this mentor. Or, you know, so now actually being my age, mentoring some people, and I'm thinking, goodness, I'm so wish I could listen all these suggestions, teaching what people will tell me to do and bringing my attention because how much time I would have saved it, how much money and stress and everything I would have saved it. Right? right. And I know right. we all, don't you think like all of us feel like this about something? Sure. Sure. Right? And, and by the way, my son just dyed his hair bright red. So I understand. Did you talk to him about that and tell him <laughs> if you do that, these kind of girls you're not going to get, these kind of girls you, <laughs> you know, these dates forget about, but that can be good, you know? Right. He said, not important, you know. Yes, I'm dealing every time with something there because of changes, all this stuff, right, going on. But, you know, I said that to say, like, sincerely, like, everybody, all of us, we have this moment, you know, because we were kids at one point. We were, you know, younger, you know, on one point, no matter how old we are right now, right? And there's something always like, oh, moment, I wish I listened. So I want to tell to dealers, don't make this to be a moment right. again because... We're kind of growing up right now, and now we have a lot more people depend on us who also we should even eh, have this moment as well, right? So it's kind of right. big deal. So the lastly, and I really thank you for everything. If you have to say, you know, in one sentence or two sentences, message to all dealers, like if they're all looking at you right now, right? Something they just need to hear it right now. Mm -hmm. you know, would you do you have anything for them? Like, would you share something? Yeah, I'd say consider if you understand all the risks that you have, because one of the things that a guy like me will do is point out risks that you might not be aware of, right? Because risks are not always apparent. They're not always staring you in the face. Some of them are in one of those 107 items in the insurance policy. You thought you have something covered but you really don't. So that's what a guy like me might be able to help uh, them with. So um, reach out and ask. I'll be glad to answer some questions for them. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And again, I appreciate you. I learn a lot from you, you know, through all our conversations you and I have. You know, now I'm more careful about lots of things. Also learning, you know, and... Uh, the biggest thing today also with, uh, you know, you open my eyes is it's okay, right? It's okay to be transparent right now. We don't have to be afraid not to get the deal because I mean, duh, you're going to sell it anywhere. Like you're right. really not losing anything. Right. And I, you know, like I talked to you about this, you know, like for lot, some time and I'm trying to figure out the best way to do it. And just now I had this aha moment. Hold on. Why am I even stressing? Like they will sell anyway, because even you drove five hours and you could have get upset and be this guy who creates all this risk to them. And, you know, but you're like, ah, I'm not going to get another union. Let's just buy it. It's nice cabins. That's what right. we're going to have. We're gonna, you like paint the picture for yourself. I'm going to put that there and there and there. Right. So that's, that's all. Right. Awesome. Well, thank, well, thank you. you for, thank mm -hmm. you for having me. I enjoyed being on. No, thank you so much again. And I know this is not the end of it. We're going to keep doing things and you have a lot coming for us. And thank you for doing this and helping dealerships, you know, thank to you, save this uh, moment. Like, all right, well, thank you again. And I see you next time. Pleasure to be here. Bye. I'm just super excited to see you here. Well.